Thank you for joining the CIO Straight Talk webcast on second generation IT outsourcing at UKAR. I'm Edward Gardner from HCL Technologies and I'm your host for today. Now, CIO Straight Talk, as some of you may know, is an award winning engagement platform for CIOs and senior IT leaders. And at the heart of the platform, which is sponsored by HCL Technologies and one of the few successful partner run CIO engagement platforms, is the belief that IT thought leaders, the best IT thought leaders, are CIOs themselves. And the best way to harness their experience and their insights is in the form of peer-to-peer -peer learning. Now, the topic of second generation outsourcing is becoming increasingly relevant, and it'll be questions around this topic that are going to be answered in today's session. And to help us understand the challenges of first generation outsourcing and how organisations are leveraging second generation models in order to overcome the traditional sourcing challenges, I have alongside me a very accomplished IT leader, Matthew Jackson, who is a member of the UK Asset Resolution and Executive Committee and is responsible for IT, change, property services and procurement. Matthew, welcome to the show. Thank you, Ed. So Matthew served as uh, Head of Transformation at UKAR, <coughs> leading the integration of Northern Rock Asset Management and Bradford and Bingley, where he'd worked for 20 years holding senior positions in operations. Now, the way this is going to work is that I will be asking Matthew a couple of questions of my own, but we're going to encourage you to ask your own questions, which will get relayed to me, and I will do my best to bring them into the dialogue. Uh, you should see a chat box at the bottom left-hand corner of the screen, uh, so you should be able to type in your questions there. So, let's start with UKAR. So, this is a company that was formed in 2010, to wind down the £110 billion of assets on the balance sheets of two previously independent UK banks, Northern Rock Asset Management and Bradford and Bingley. These banks were forced into nationalised ownership during the economic downturn. So Matthew, uh, what was the newly formed bank's primary objective and what was the roadmap uh, for getting there? So the primary objective was, um, I guess the mission is to maximise value for the taxpayer. Um, through the orderly rundown of the two mortgage books and to effectively repay the taxpayer. Um, underpinning this are the five objectives of the organisation, reduce and protect and optimise the balance sheet, to maximise cost efficiency and effectiveness through continuous improvement, to be excellent in customer and debt management, uh, for the organisation to be a great place to work and also to treat all stakeholders fairly. So that's kind of like the organisational objectives. The context for the audience is that at the point of nationalisation, the two uh, organisations re received government funding um, of uh, £50 billion. Mm -hmm. And so our primary objective is obviously to wind down the balance sheet and the £110 billion as it was and pay the taxpayer back in that process. Now, the process that we went through was uh, enterprise-wide transformation which was effectively to facilitate it through the integration of common systems, processes, and we achieved this through a two-year programme of work, which not only led to driving efficiencies and the effectiveness of bringing two organisations together and the economies of scale that you drive through that, but at the same time we had to invest heavily in terms of the customer and debt management proposition okay. at the uh, time of the two organisations to coming together in 2010 the level of impairment if I cast my mind back was 17 percent in that year we had an impairment charge of a billion pounds on the balance sheet okay. so we had a big job of work not only in terms of bringing these two entities together mm -hmm. which in itself is a is a sizable task but also to invest in those areas to ensure that we manage the area position and continue to facilitate you know our primary intent which is to deliver value and pay back the taxpayer at the end of the day sure so if the primary responsibility <coughs> of the company is to gradually run down the balance sheets how does the company look at opportunities for growth and what, what role does IT play in this it's an interesting one, isn't it? Uh, because you know our our strategy is to to run the business down, and that's the stated uh, objectives. Um, we're at a point in our evolution, should I say, where we are considering the high level uh, future of the organisation, and um, you know what we are minded to is the fact that 
um, as we continue to succeed in doing what we're doing um, in terms of managing the arrears levels, uh, working with customers in terms of facilitating the redemptions and paying back the, the government, that becomes increasingly difficult to achieve um, because, you know, as the organisation contracts, it becomes subscale uh, and operational risks ensue as a consequence of that. And we're minded to the fact that at some point in that journey, it will become harder to essentially uh, retain and attract people. We also have the backdrop of our ownership has EU restrictions, um, and so we can't you know, go out and grow new channels um, or enter new markets. But what we do need to do is take account of the challenges that I've outlaid in terms of the operational risk. Mm -hmm. And so what we are looking at at the moment is what the options are for the organisation. And there's a number of uh, opportunities there. One of them is continue as is and manage that you know, continued risk that I've outlined. The second one is to create an operating organisation, so perhaps in a, a different ownership structure such as a JV, uh, whereby you can grow that new entity and therefore you know, bring opportunities and prospects to the people while still servicing the, the books and delivering the primary intent. The, there may be an opportunity in terms of you know, creation of a UK challenger bank yeah. uh, out, out of this organisation, um, a wholesale uh, of the organisation at some point in time. So there are, there are three or four different paths within which we can you know, go down um, and IT is integral to all of, yeah. all of those. So what I have to do um, as you know, responsible for IT is ensure that you know, we essentially are agile, nimble and able to continue to manage IT efficiently and take cost out of IT but also enable it to have uh, the options of scaling up um, to uh, any one of those four different uh, scenarios that we've talked about. I see. Okay. So we've learned, it's been widely broadcast, that a key condition of government aid was to separate Northern Rock Asset Management from its parent company, which was itself <coughs> sold to Virgin Money. Mm. And one of the most effective ways of doing this was to combine Northern Rock Asset Management with Bradford and Bingley. So can you take us through some of the, the complexities, the regulatory restrictions and, and other challenges that were involved in this process? Sure. So the, I guess the first objective of migrating away from Northern Rock was to enable it to be sold. You know, as you've noted, it, it was sold to uh, Virgin Money, and that, that was political. Um, you know, Northern Rock, as a part of its nationalisation, was effectively, you know, uh, split into an organisation that's two thirds, you know, mortgage assets that needed to be run down, and a, and a third which was a, you know, a normal intact monoline mortgage bank. Um, and so, what we needed to do is effectively transition away. Um, that made the merger easier from, a, from an integration perspective because we chose the typical defender model and we effectively migrated the data and the people from Northern Rock Asset Management into a scaled up Bradford and Bingley. Uh, Bradford and Bingley itself had gone through a number of challenges in that it, part of its nationalisation, its savings book was divested and sold. Uh, its IT organisation was right-sized as a consequence of that. The data uh, coming into that organisation was probably two-thirds bigger than the Bradford and Bingley infrastructure that existed. So what we had to do was essentially uh, scale up that infrastructure, but at the same time we had to go through a significant transformation programme with regards to the actual data and migration uh, that we were undertaking. Now, I'll come back onto that in a, in a second, but. I think the biggest challenge was the formation of a new company with its own identity, vision, mission, objectives that I've outlined and fundamentally a business that was you know, very different from the heritage businesses of Bradford and Bingley and Northern Rock Asset Management. Um, and you know, against the backdrop and, and you know, perverse logic of winding down your organisation, you know, we, we had to motivate and you know, get people galvanised to that intent. And we also had, as I've noted earlier on, EU restrictions about what, what we could do. And within that, we had the objective of actually uh, achieving the migration within a 12-month period. So by the end of 2011, December 2011, we had to um, undertake what was a significantly complex programme of work. So context, 
a mortgage book, 700,000 accounts, 50 billion in assets, 33,000 uh, product types, um, uh, 80 million uh, customer images, 10 terabytes of data, a general ledger, a treasury management solution, um, tens of thousands of customers calls coming in every day, yeah. and so a telephony infrastructure. So we, we effectively had to uh, migrate that into, as I say, the scaled up Bradford and Bingley. Uh, we didn't quite achieve 12 months. We, we pulled it off in 15 months, uh, which I don't think was a bad thing. I could probably have forgiven myself for two and a half years, but uh, well, that's what I told people anyway. So that, so that was the, the context around the, the work that we had to undertake. Okay, fantastic. So you mentioned that the company's <coughs> primary operational focus is cost efficiency and effectiveness. Now, given that IT forms a fairly substantial part of the cost base, how did the company develop its IT sourcing strategy? And where did HCL come into this? Okay, so context again, IT, a substantial part of the fixed cost base that everybody knows. Uh, IT was heavily outsourced uh, within you know, the infrastructure which was Bradford and Bingley's. Um, Bradford and Bingley um, started um, in outsourcing probably in the late 90s, but in a big way in 2002, whereby um, uh, it, it went into two primary um, uh, main deals. One, telco, so you know, telephony operations, contact centres, WAN, LAN, you know, networks, mobile, and then all of the rest with another vendor, uh, which was eventually out hosted with their, in their own infrastructure. Um, now, the contracts were fit for purpose at the time, um, but as time went on, they, they, you know, 10 years is a long time for a relationship like that, so the contract in that period uh, was less favourable for ourselves, didn't offer the, the flexibility that we wanted. Uh, the service was uh, becoming unstable, uh, the relationship was becoming difficult um, and we needed to find a way within which we could variableize the cost base and make IT more efficient. Mm. So, you know, the objectives that we had through the sourcing approach was uh, to variableize the cost base, stabilize the service, um, we wanted to change the uh, contractual arrangements uh, from your atypical availability type arrangements to more outcome based SLAs on critical business processes. We needed a, a relationship whereby uh, we, we had leverage uh, with, with the vendors um, and uh, we were important to the vendors so senior executive uh, relationship management was important yeah. to us. We needed uh, innovation. Uh, we needed uh, strong and robust governance sure. and clearly we wanted to you know, do uh, the transaction as low risk as we possibly could. Mm -hmm. So the sourcing approach that we took, we started in 2010. Um, the um, contract was uh, signed in November 2011 and the service, uh, the first part of the service, the IT services uh, migrated and were live from June 2013 and the telco was uh, uh, July uh, 2013. And you used a sourcing advisor. In that we process. did. We did actually. We used Equitaria, um, who um, at the time were independent, now part of KPMG. So they helped us formulate and validate our servicing approach. Uh, we considered different models. You know, from multi-source to dual dual supply, sure. prime contractor. We decided on uh, that a prime contractor was the right approach for us. Uh, because of our simplified business model. Now, I know that's probably not the in vogue thing to do, and I can understand that, but for us it was appropriate. Yeah. Um, from a, a HCL perspective, you know, I, I guess we got there in terms of um, we got SLAs based upon, you know, the, the um, critical business process, so outcome based. Sure. Um, we have got some great protections in there in terms of your know, benchmarking. Uh, innovation mm -hmm. uh, into the contract. Uh, it's fully Cisgate compliant, which was important to us. Uh, we've got access to technology, um, thought leadership, and, and, and the really important one was that executive sponsorship as well, yeah. uh, that we were really, we, we were really looking to uh, achieve through this. So that was the process that we undertook. Like I said, that the, we, we signed on the dotted line in November 2011. Yeah. We migrated 
um, and achieved it in uh, June 2013. That was longer than what we anticipated, mm -hmm. if I'm being honest. Um, we, we had some challenges in, in, in the process. Uh, we had some issues um, with regards to uh, intellectual or alleged intellectual property rights in terms of the construct of the current um, uh, or the existing configuration. Yeah. So, so we had to go through a wholesale rebuild of the infrastructure and so you know it took us longer but we achieved that migration in you know probably 18 months okay super so I have a question here about uh, transparency so in many traditional outsourcing uh, outsourcing engagements some of the service components are hidden so they remain in a, in a sort of uh, black box that's only visible to the service provider <coughs> and that often presents problems to customers who are struggling to uh, regain control of the service outcomes and the governance. So can you talk us through some of the potential ways that these issues can get resolved? And if changes aren't possible, would you ever advise bringing the, uh, the services back in-house or even transitioning over to a new service provider? That's an interesting question, isn't it? Um, I think, so I mean, we were definitely in the black box environment, yeah. you know, particularly when you've been in those kind of relationships Ten years plus, so, and we and, and I'd characterise that as not understanding your service, your service makeup, your architecture, your inter interdependencies at a level that you should do, yeah. right? You, you know it, of course, but I don't think you, you you know it to the level that you should do. So the things to overcome that, um, from my perspective, I'd say retain control and understanding of your architecture. Uh, clearly supported by fully documented solutions, yeah. architectural designs, make sure that you are making the decisions about the key architecture. Obvious things, but you know, sometimes you, 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 you find that if you check yourself, you've lost some of those disciplines. Yeah. Uh, develop a transparent contract, clear understanding. I mean, I've touched on IP. I, I would not underestimate IP. You know, you might not know in terms of the way in which your current um, um, solution is configured, uh, what levels of IP are in there. And also, if you're getting services in a in, you know, total managed service way and in a black box, you need to understand what elements of uh, how, how that service is formed in the context of software. So with the uh, previous incumbent, uh, a lot of our middleware was provided through, through the, that institution which we were taking into the new arrangement um, and there was a lot of hidden cost yeah. um, in terms of you know what what that software truly cost which was masked through the previous kind of um, um, commercial model yeah. so get a better understanding of that um, I think you know moving forward from that you need to have strong governance of the relationship you know in the key disciplines of architecture service you need to ensure that from a commercial point of view, you've got clearly defined um, accountabilities. So, you know, from both of you, you know, you know the, the, um, I, I often used to think about and quote our former uh, CIO where, you know, the service really was with the, I, the vendor, yeah. you know, it, they're doing it for us. And, and to me, that's just a, the wrong mindset. You know, the, the, you're the accountability accountable officer and you make sure you know how that service is provisioned and, and how um, that that service should be um, you know ev evolved effectively I mean from a perspective of any CIO listening to this thinking about what to do I think personally to me uh, it's a difficult one because it, it really depends upon your scenario the challenges that you've got with the incumbent, uh, your organisational objectives, um, your appetite for risk and how easy you could extricate yourself from the current contract. Yeah. You know, we were at the end of a 10 year period. Yeah. If you're wanting to, you know, get out halfway through, you've got a lot of cost and complexity yeah. in terms of doing that. And really neither option is, is easy as, you know, retaining the incumbent provider um, will have challenges because the reality of it is is that if you're unhappy with the relationship through whatever means because of cost because of poor service lack of innovation all those kind of things you know uh, I can absolutely understand the uh, I guess the desire to make that work um, but you know you've probably been trying to do that all along 
And so you've got to you've got to kind of look yourself in the eye and think, you know, if I don't take this opportunity to seek out a different provider, albeit that it will have challenges and complexities, you know, you really don't have much right to complain in a year's time if it's the same. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, I wouldn't underestimate the challenge, however, and I sympathise with organisations as they go through that, that journey. Yeah. So, so let's suppose that you do ultimately decide to exit a sourcing <coughs> contract for all the reasons that you've, you've, you've touched on. So you know, maybe there's value is no longer getting delivered, maybe you really cannot regain control of the service components, <coughs> maybe the relationship between client and vendor has uh, irreparably broken down. What advice would you give to an organisation to ensure a safe and a secure exit? Okay, so I think my, my advice is clearly based upon the experience I've got, um, which, you know, it, it will differ depending upon your situation and what level of outsourced services you have. But I think my, my list would be um, absolutely have a detailed exit plan, mm -hmm. clear accountability, spend a lot of time on that. I think in terms of um, the actual approach, with your current vendor, um, insist upon an exit team. Yeah. I had two different uh, flavours of that. Uh, one vendor had a, an, executive, a, a, an executive who was responsible for exit that was off account who came in, yeah. um, had no issues, no past baggage. It was about doing a job. The other team was formed of the existing, uh, the existing team uh, in terms of the exit. And that brought all different levels of connotations and challenges because mm -hmm. you've got, you know, the complexity of um, that team also being focused on you run the business uh, activities and therefore the conflicts in priorities yeah. uh, with the exit activities. Uh, you had the uh, added challenges there in terms of uh, the, 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 the motivation and the behaviours of those individuals because there will be a consequence yeah. uh, to those individuals at the end of the day. Um, which also need to be managed uh, through. So you can't, I think, get to a place where you completely use a different set of people because you'll need the embedded knowledge and skills of those individuals. Uh, but I think if you have a, an exit management team and a wrapper around that, it, it, it will help demonstrably uh, because they'll be more impartial and more focused at the job in hand. Other areas thinking about it, I would say joint governance across all parties involved. So in that, <clears throat> Clearly, from a programme delivery point of view, you need to have, you know, uh, all parties there, the existing incumbents, uh, plural probably, and the new incumbent, maybe plural, depending upon your model. Uh, you as the CIO need to be in control of that. So you need to have that governance in place, which is managing the programme of work, ensuring that, you know, all, all your programme deliverables are being achieved. But at the same time, um, that needs to permutate down your, your, your respective organisations in terms of ensuring that you've got those touch points at the various levels, right down to daily huddles with the, uh, the, the guys on the ground, guys and girls on the ground who are do, doing the job of work. Because it is absolutely you know, uh, amazing and shouldn't be underestimated you know, what levels of you know, either passive or react, uh, you know, yeah. uh, active resistance you will get at mm -hmm. that stage. And so you need to, you know, drumbeat it and basically have those forums in place whereby any issues you're managing them. Mm -hmm. I think the other important thing uh, which we leveraged quite significantly was in terms of the executive relationship management. And <clears throat> that's on a number of levels. So um, with the um, existing incumbent, make sure you've got um, executive um, out off account uh, relationships um, and ensuring that you've got an accountable officer sponsor yeah. who, whose job of work is to ensure that you have continued stable service and focus service and also that their team play the game in relation to the exit mm -hmm. uh, and you need to get that. Uh, I uh, was fortunate um, in that um, the chairman of our organisation uh, was involved in this process, as was the board. Yeah. At the same time, in regards to um, with HCL, we also ensured that um, we had the same touch points and the same level of engagement at board level, okay. uh, chairman level, with with uh, with yourselves. Mm. So you know, all that helped in terms of the process. Um, and I think, you know, just generally, you just need to think about the behaviours of the people involved and have a plan around that. Um, I think 
get a clear understanding of the architecture, the IP, yeah. if there is any alleged IP in there, and as I've touched on the embedded software. Um, I, think, I think the other thing, thinking about it, um, is uh, in relation to uh, the people sides. If you are migrating away, um, you need to think about um, you know, the individuals who would pa be passing over from the existing incumbent to the new vendor. Uh, I fell into the trap of um, letting the two parties talk to each other about that transition um, and, and that doesn't really work. Mm -hmm. you're, you're accountable, you need to manage that, yeah. you need to ensure that you're, you're oversighting it because at the end of the day it's your liabilities in terms of any payments etc that's involved in that. Um, I think in terms of knowledge discovery, uh, that's in a key important area. So knowledge discovery, knowledge transfer, make sure you've got those mechanisms in place. And even uh, work shadowing, that's an important thing uh, as well. Um, and, and I think you know the key thing as well is, is documentation. It depends on what the migration approach is, depends upon what therefore uh, the level of documentation you've got. But yeah. when you're moving across into your new set up, make sure you've got clearly articulated designs and run books in terms of how that works, because clearly you don't want to give the new vendor a get out of jail if they don't fully understand it either, do Absolutely. you? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, great. So we've got a question here about the contract. So you mentioned earlier that it needs to be inherently uh, agile and flexible. So based on your experience, can you give us some recommendations on how such a contract can be put together? Um, <clears throat> Yeah, so I think, again, I think you need to uh, understand your IP, your architectural design, your installation, data architecture, you know, the, 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 the what and where. Yeah. Uh, from a, from a behaviour management, you need to understand the impact of that. Um, I think the key thing that you need to do is really get to a point whereby, you know, you, um, from a contractual point of view, you, you, you need to get to a place where uh, you get good lawyers. So external legal advice. Yeah. Yeah, so I think if you, if you, if you get um, external legal advice, that's really quite important because they'll be able to help you um, in terms of construct, uh, you know, the right um, contract and, yeah, the, and, yeah. and the right um, kind of construct for that. Okay. Okay. So um, let's say when an organisation's taking the decision to switch from their incumbent to one or more new service providers, what would you say are the main things that they need to look out for? Um, so I, I'm, I am I'm a bit like a broken record here, I do apologise. But I think understanding uh, your current service, yeah. you know, where your data resides, your architectural designs, your embedded software, uh, the behaviours, behaviour management, you need to have a battle plan as I've talked about, get that executive sponsorship and relationship, uh, pre-plan as much as possible, um, you know, uh, the people sides think about the tupi components. Um, you know, we we had pension augmentation issues. Uh, it, it, it kind of added to the cost associated mm -hmm. with the migration. So it's difficult, is that because actually under tupi, the uh, current uh, you know employer of people are not obliged to actually provide information to the new incumbent. I think it was 14 days. I think it's moving to 28 days okay. now before. Um, so you need to really, uh, you know, as the customer, get involved in that to try and get some of that information. Uh, knowledge transfer um, is key. Make sure you know who the key people are on the account. Make sure you put provisions in place to protect those individuals and that they are there throughout the period of the transition. You know, when, when the account is kind of going, there will be an incentive for people to want to leave and go on to new accounts yeah. and, you know, prospect, etc. Um, but you know, make sure you protect yourself and ensure that you get commitment that those people will be around. I think the other thing is that you really need to test your assumptions and uh, you know, in terms of your, your planning on the migration approach. Yeah. Um, you know, really test your your, your, your hypotheses. As I've talked about in our situation, we um, had a, a, a kind of a view that we could just go in, clone, lift and drop. Mm you know, and, and we could do that in, in short order. Uh, it didn't end up being like that. We had to go through a much more labour intensive process, which actually, as I sit here today, I'm more than comfortable with yeah. because, you know, we've, we've reinstalled it, we've done it from scratch, we're comfortable with that process and, and you 
uh, as the new vendor, are, 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 you know, fully understand that infrastructure and know how to run it, which you wouldn't necessarily have to the same extent yeah. uh, if you were just cloning a configuration mm. that was already there. And I think that you know one of the things it probably sounds a bit crass is that you need to really test yourself as as a CIO in terms of you know your you, your resolve yeah. um, and wh and whether you really you know um, uh, want to do this um, you know and because it will take a lot of time and dedication for your own self yeah. and your team uh, to undertake this transformation. Um, but you're not on your own. It's an organisational wide challenge, yeah. and you need to share that. Mm. Okay, great. So, so going back to UKAR, and uh, I, I'm, I'm asking here for your experience with the traditional IT sourcing models that you have. <coughs> How have your expectations changed with the new service model, the new vendor? So clearly, there's been a number of learnings with the new vendor. But what are the main areas now that you pay special attention to? Well, you know, I, I absolutely demand greater control, um, as I've talked about flexibility. You know, I've mm. bought innovation and agility from the service provider, yeah. so that's a key area for me. Um, I think in terms of, you know, strategic direction, make sure that you are fully in control of all the control levers around your assets, your tooling, mm. hosting. Um, focus on strong governance. I think, you know, don't underplay the governance. Um, really you know, get that articulated well within your contract and um, really manage that. Start as you mean to go on, you know, through your transition period, right through it into your run service. Um, you know, I guess in a normal multi-source environment, you, you've got other leverage, incentivise your providers f around greater co collaboration. Uh, in our case, I don't particularly have to worry about that. Um, but I think, you know, I'd, I'd, I learned, I'd, I heard something the other, the other day about... Uh, a CIO that um, had um, uh, workshopped what the principles were and what the operating uh, kind of working ways were between uh, itself and its very multi-source vendors yeah. uh, and got them to collectively come up with, uh, I, I guess, a, a standard set of principles and common practices that they will mm. uh, they will follow um, and got them to sign up on the dotted line and is mounted up that up in his in his uh, his room I think you know something like that is it, it might sound a bit crass but actually I think it's quite powerful mm. yeah because it brings them all together I, I think also you need to think about uh, one of the things that how you draw on the services um, one of the things that we have gone heavy on is ensuring that um, we've uh, catalogued as many of our services so you you know make it a commodity type product whereby you've got great procurement at the back end of it and you've got strong SLAs and great service provision so that's an area that uh, I'm very keen to ensure that uh, you you provide to us mm -hmm. and I think the, the key thing is ensure that you you align your sourcing strategy um, so and and the business strategy to ensure that you know our, our IT and business are are aligned, and IT and vendor are aligned, yes. and there's no disconnect in that regard, mm -hmm. and that that's obvious, but you know not always the in case. Practice. Yeah. So, what type of measurements and metrics can you use to monitor the success of switching vendors? Um, I, th I think um, I mean the the key thing for me was about the. Um, the, the program had, um, we, we went through obviously, as I've talked about, detailed exit planning process. Yeah. And the deliverable out of that is a clearly defined plan uh, with clear accountabilities uh, across the different uh, groups. And in that plan, um, you, you will have milestones and key deliverables. And my uh, advice is that you track it daily and you report on it daily. And if there's any variance in that plan, going back to the governance model that I've talked about, you make sure that you get it back on plan, right? Whether it's, you know, at the, the lower level in terms of the uh, huddles between the respective teams. So that, that was a very powerful tool mm -hmm. for our situation. Um, and, you know, because this is where you, you will start to deal with, you know, kind of challenges and behaviours which you know I'd, I'd, it's just human nature, yeah. uh, but you you unless you've got that clarity in terms of the accountabilities, the deliverable, you you will get the you know the he says she says and it's not my fault, Gov, yeah. 
and that's what you need to mitigate against. And at the same time, I think in terms of the um, the uh, to be so in your in my case, you the vendor, um, you need to ensure that the the contractual um, uh, incentives also ensure um, that you know the the program of work is is tightly managed and controlled. So what we did there is once we define the exit plan is ensure that the payment milestones uh, were, were linked yeah. uh, to key deliverables. Um, so uh, we didn't really pay as you go. Uh, we, we linked it to key critical parts of the life cycle of the programme, yeah. which meant actually periods where um, you weren't paid for quite a, quite a while. But what it did do is focus the mind and ensure we achieved a milestone. Sure. And when you get a milestone achieved, you get paid, which is good. But after that, there's a period of, of stability and stabilisation. Depends on the migration approach, obviously. But if you don't get that stability in, uh, uh, within a short period of time, again, if you construct your uh, contract in a way which enables you to have liquidated damages, yeah. again, that incentivises the mind. So there's a number of different things at play there. Um, and, and my advice is you use all of the above. Yeah. So now we've, we've been asked for some advice that you could give to your peer CIOs and aspiring IT leaders. Uh, so in your opinion, what are the most important factors to consider when you're facing a really complex transformation programme, such as the one that you faced at UKAR? I think a steadfast personal resolve, to be, to be honest with you, and, but you need individually, but you absolutely need the backing and commitment yeah. Uh, from the top management yeah. within the organisation. You know, the reality of it is, Ed, that, that the process is complex, it's, it's costly, mm. and it's time-consuming. It, um, and, you know, it, it will probably be longer than you think it will be. Yeah. And be transparent about that, and don't assume that your peers will, will automatically know. I mean, there is a bit of a nugget there. Don't, um, you know, kind of scare them to death, <laughs> okay. right? Because you'll never get anywhere. But at the same time, you know, make sure they're cognizant of the challenges. But also, in that process, make sure they're fully aware of what the, the benefits are. Sure. Yeah? And the benefits aren't just always about cost. It's all, it's all the stuff that I've talked about in terms of innovation, yeah. relationship, you know, the alignment of the business, the agility that you'll get, all of those things. So you need to really articulate all that and make sure people uh, understand it and buy into the process. And you also need to ensure that actually throughout the, the, the engagement in the transition period, you're regularly communicating. You know, I, um, as noticed, sit on the executive at UCAR, so I was talking to my executive colleagues uh, every week about progress, mm -hmm. uh, good, bad progress regardless of, but the key thing was how we were managing it um, and what we were doing to recover if there was a problem. Um, I uh, had a monthly update to the board. Um, I delivered uh, you know, presentations to the senior leadership on a regular basis. We communicated to the rest of the organisation about progress on a regular basis. It's important to do that. Um, and you need to have strong governance. You need to ensure that any issues that you've got are managed head on yeah. and, and you deal with them quickly um, because you can lose a lot of time in that process unless you do manage it quickly. I, I think the one thing that I always do reflect on is the fact that, um, you know, because, because of our organisational situation, um, I, I didn't have to factor into the business case uh, much around loss of potential revenue, um, you know, in terms of new business generation for new products and stuff like that. But the reality of it is, is whilst you're undertaking such an exercise, there will be change freezes, yeah. there will be times when, um, you know, you, you will need the business to be with you and accept that you can't launch a new product or enter a new market mm -hmm. um, at, within a short period, wherever that change freeze is. So you need to ensure that the, um, the P&L owners uh, and you are, are, are like that, yeah. really, yeah. And, and, you know, and you're aware of that. But you need to sell the benefits you know, it's the what they're going to get at the end of it that yeah. matters to them. Sure. Okay. So we have time for one more question, and this one is about the contracts that you have with your new vendor. So you mentioned that HCL's contract is uh, has outcome-based 
contracts and it's got SLAs yeah. that are linked to your business priorities. Can you explain a little bit more about this and tell us how it works? Okay, so it's quite a simple construct. Um, essentially, um, instead of the, the normal availability across the, you know, the, the normal service line contract, we defined as a part of the process um, 14 cri critical business uh, processes. Mm. And instead of looking at the IT service delivery across the, the vertical you know, lines that make up the overall service proposition, uh, we, 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 uh, we looked at that um, down from the business process. So one of the areas that I've talked about is debt management. So uh, we have a critical business uh, service level around debt management and everything that makes up the service that the, the, the colleagues need. So if, if there is a, a degradation or a service outage within any of those stacks um, that underpin that service, um, there will be um, a service you know, impairment or credit associated with that. And it, it actually just focuses the mind because we can say what the actual impact is to the colleague, whereas if, if it's more kind of in the traditional availability, the triggers invariably don't get there as quick. Yeah. Um, and, and to me, that's the beauty of it. I see. Okay, well, we're out of time. Um, that was a very uh, interesting conversation with some really powerful insights. So from the audience and me, Matthew, a sincere note of thanks. It's my pleasure. And uh, for our audience, uh, thank you very much again for joining us. I hope you found this useful and that you'll be able to join us again for the next CIO Straight Talk webcast. Until then, goodbye. <laughs>